As you know, Tuesday is our day to vote. Please do so if you haven't done that already. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to, to be involved in this great gift of a country that we live in. Along those lines, Friday, November 11th, I think that's Friday, right? Okay. Is Veterans Day. Veterans Day started out as a remembrance of those who fought and died in the Great War, World War I. There was a cessation of hostility. On November 11th, 1918, And that cessation of hostility officially began at 11 a.m. Over the years, after World War II, the observance of Veterans Day, and it began to be, it, when it first began, it was known as, um, I have this somewhere, Armistice Day. Thank you, yes. I you know it was, I knew it was something very simple and very clear and I just blah. Uh, but in let's see in 1954 on October 8th 1954 President Eisenhower turned it into Veterans Day by signing the Veterans Day proclamation which stated, in order to ensure proper and widespread observance of this anniversary, all veterans, all veterans organizations, and the entire citizenry will wish to join hands in common purpose towards this end. And he lays out some of the necessary structure to that, uh, creating a, a position that would actually make sure that we observe that as a, as a, as a citizenry. So Veterans Day differs from Memorial Day in that Veterans Day was was turned to celebrate all veterans, those that served, those that have have been a part of. Did did uh, did we get that video loaded up? I forgot to tell anybody. No. Okay. Um, Jen, you want to jump back there and do this for me? Sorry about this. Technical difficulties residing in my mind. Um, it's the video we salute our veterans. Okay, so while they're getting that loaded up, I'll uh, I'll wax eloquent a little while longer. Memorial Day, we serve those that have paid the price. Veterans Day, we support and and celebrate all those that have have had a part. Veterans Day is. I think it's very right and very beautiful and very honoring and, and acts as a, a very strong reminder that the freedom that we enjoy, the freedom to gather and worship that we enjoy, the freedom to celebrate that we enjoy, the freedom to choose the jobs that we decide we want to take, all of those freedoms, that all that we enjoy here is because Men and women have sacrificed their time and in some cases their very lives to buy that for us and then continue to ensure that for us. So I have a very special place of honor in my heart for veterans. Um, I'm very proud that my dad, who was born and raised in Cuba, one of the first things he did when he came to the United States was to serve in the United States military. And he always had a, a great joyful pride that that he did that um and was he <laughs> was not necessarily very happy that his son didn't follow in his footsteps in that place uh but of, of all the things that i would like to do over again in my life that is perhaps the largest one that i would like to i wish i had served this country in her military to continue to ensure the freedoms that were so hard gained. So let's take a few moments. We'll have a video 
that celebrates and that honors our veterans and this day of remembrance. And on Friday, remember that uh, it is a godly thing to serve something greater. And there are many parallels and many metaphors that can be pulled from the military life to inform and educate and strengthen the Christian life. Well, let's watch this video with that in mind. I don't want to say a big amen to that video. That uh, we we really need to be grateful for all that we've been blessed with, and through their hands and feet. Well, we have been journeying through a series that 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 I titled "All Things Rooted" (ATR), and in that series, we celebrated our story as recorded for us in scripture. And we dug in to some of those stories. Now this, again, this, this all things rooted started back in June, June 5th was our first all things rooted. And we've had 12 lessons over 21 weeks with a couple of extras in, in, in thrown into the mix there. Uh, we, had a day of living rooted, the fall festival Sunday, and then JJ led us in a beautiful day on a day of remembrance on 9 11. And I think it all fits in really quite beautifully that, that all things rooted include these things of life, because I mean, that's exactly what I was trying to, to bring out in that, in this, in this idea of being rooted to God, being rooted in God's love, that all of life becomes rooted in God. The idea, the main idea that I started out with that I really wanted to, to bring to light was that all of life for the believer is informed by, empowered by, designed by, defined by Yahweh. Yahweh above and Emmanuel here on the ground. And that we would take a journey, this all things rooted journey, by exploring familiar Bible narratives and teachings and examining their rootedness that on the one hand, rootedness informed the perspectives and understandings and actions that we found in these passages that we looked at, these stories, these narratives that we looked at. And on another hand, not the other hand, but on another hand, how that rootedness informs our perspective, our understandings, our actions and reactions to life. Now, at this point, I wanted to do a quick overview of what we covered in 21 weeks. I'm not sure you want to be here till tomorrow. But I want to remind us that we started by looking at the concept of chesed, which I think is a, a, a perfect place to start. Obviously, that's where I you know, started it and I designed it. So, you know, I would, th I would think that, right? I hope you agree. But what we found in that look at the word has said, God's kindness, God's loyalty, God's love, God's steadfast love, his covenant love, is that the Old Testament version of um, the Old Testament version of the Old Testament, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, took that word Yahweh, the proper name of God, and translated it with the English word, um, the English word, the Greek word, mercy. So in the New Testament, where we see mercy, the Jewish ears of the day heard the word Yahweh. And for the Jewish ears of the day, the difference between God's mercy And God's kindness was invisible. There was no difference. That mercy and kindness are the same stuff. They're the same thing. They are rooted in and spring forth out of the very centra, centra, most central characteristic of the core of God's character. And that when we are called to exercise mercy on others, we are called to live God's chesed towards others.
And as we desire God's mercy, we are desiring God's kindness, his loyalty, his love. I know that in the early years of my Christianity, and actually up until the last couple of years, I saw mercy as forgiveness, not getting what I deserve, right? Sinful man, I deserve God's punishment, God's wrath. Mercy was not getting that. And grace was getting what I don't deserve, God's love, God's providence, God's leading, God's equipping, God's gifts. But the more I dig into this idea of mercy in the New Testament, and chesed in the Old Testament, and see the direct connection, the Jews didn't see it that way. God's kindness is what meets us in our sinfulness. And as we enter into relationship with him, God's loyalty leads us forward, stays with us. And his steadfast love refuses to leave us. And all of that is his mercy. And he calls on us to live that towards one another not just in these four walls but everywhere so that his name is known for the right reasons oh i so much want to go over all these because i was just so happy with this but what i'll try and do is maybe by next week have a handout for you that's got a little couple of three lines for each each lesson that we did but we did a lot of things we looked at uh we looked at David and Goliath. Uh, we looked at David's uh, dancing before the Lord. Uh, we looked at how we should be confident in faith, that rooted faith is confident in God's involvement, God's reaction, God's intervention. We, uh, we looked at Zacchaeus and decided that Zacchaeus was not such a wee little man after all, that in God's eyes, he was big and beautiful and wonderful. And that some of those things that Zacchaeus portrayed, his desire, his hunger to know the Lord so much, to, to meet Jesus so badly that he didn't care if as a rich man he completely embarrassed himself. But seeing Jesus was more important and how that should be something that our lives should reflect. That we want to see Jesus and truly meet Jesus and have time with Jesus so much that we don't care if the world thinks we're idiots. We don't care if our peers look down upon us. We want to see Jesus first and foremost. And then we took several weeks to look at Daniel. And one of the amazing things that jumped off the page this time, and again, one of those things that, that Ken Thornton says, when, when did that get there? Was how significant it was that Daniel so deeply, so deeply believed in the sovereignty of God that he was able to serve the enemy king faithfully and dutifully. Now, in our fractured society, in our take one side or the other society, we would refuse to serve that king and be killed for it or be fired for it or suffer for it and, and would be proud martyrs. And I'm not going to say that that's always wrong. But I think we need to consider Daniel's perspective as well. That Daniel served the enemy king so faithfully, and there's two sides to that faithfully coin that we'll get to in here in just a second. Even in the midst of the enemy's land. So faithfully, two sides of the coin. First side of that coin, he was over, overtly Jewish. We would say overtly Christian in our, in our day and time. He was overtly, overtly a worshiper of Yahweh God, a servant of Yahweh God, first and foremost. He did not hide that fact. 
And yet, in or, or in the midst of that dedication to Yahweh God, first and foremost, he saw all of life as service to Yahweh God. So in his position in the enemy king's service, forced service, remember they were captured, he served so well that the enemy king saw blessings coming from God through him, from Yahweh God through him. Daniel didn't use his life as a servant of Yahweh God as a reason to not serve the enemy king. Rather, he used it as energy and impetus and purpose to greatly serve the enemy king. How did Jesus put it? You've heard it said. Let's see, how did he put it? Love your enemy. Oh, yeah, that's right. Love in Scripture is not emotionally driven. It is purposefully driven to bless another. Love your enemy. Bless your enemy. So captured, Daniel did. He served so well while still being overtly Jewish, while still being overtly a servant of Yahweh God, that Darius, the king who was tricked into throwing Daniel in the lion's den, was ripped apart and couldn't sleep that night for fear of what has been done to his beloved servant. And in the morning ran to the tomb, crying out, has your God saved you? And when Daniel replied, God has indeed saved him. And Daniel was inspected, not a scratch was found upon him. Darius issued a decree to all nations. This is the one true God. Daniel's God is the one true God. That concept just blew my mind and has been something that has haunted me since studying that back in July. And it came back up when we got to Jesus. I mean, to, well, yeah, of course to Jesus, but to David in the last few lessons that we've had on rootedness, that David was living with the enemy Philistines in one of their little fiefdoms. And he served his little fiefdom king so well, again, Philistines, Jews didn't really get along. Remember, David killed the great big ugly one? Big battles after that? But David served his enemy king so well. <laughs> Should have done a compare and contrast between the Philistine enemy king and Saul a Jewish king. When Saul saw David's life of service to God Almighty, his heart was hardened. And he hated David for his godliness and his success and his favor from God. Whereas the Philistine king, the enemy king, came to love David for the blessings that it brought his town, the protection it brought his little fiefdom. And that king defended David to the other Philistine kings and commanders and said to David, you are as an angel of Yahweh God to me. You are his messenger. You are his blessing. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a concept that just... almost drives me crazy because in my human self, I want to stand up against the, the enemy and I want to push them away and keep them at arm's length and say, you're wrong and you're going to burn and you're, you're going to miss all of this good stuff. Whereas for Daniel and David, 
It's almost as if they embraced where they were, even though it was in the enemy's camp. And said, God is with me even here. Watch him move even now. I wonder what would happen if we took that attitude to our places of work. Now, for me, <laughs> you know, it's good. So I'm very fortunate. But, but for you, what would that do? Do your employers look at you and say, I'm not even a Christian, but I'm telling you, I'm glad that person is here. They make this place better. Well, in these 21 weeks, we have looked at so many different concepts and so many different stories. A big theme was the sovereignty of God, that we need to root ourselves to the sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign. But he's not sovereign and aloof. He is sovereign and involved. He is among us. He is with us. And that kept coming up over and over and over. God is with us. We looked at even that home is the place that God is. And that in John, Jesus tells his, his, his closest, just as he's fixing to leave, one of the last things he teaches them is that he and the Father would come and make their home with those who obey, with those who love him and, and take on his, him as Lord and radically obey joyfully that God will make his home with us. Matthew puts it that he is Emmanuel, God with us. I don't believe it was just for those 33 years that, that, that Matthew was calling him that, targeting that period. But that God is with us even now. We believe that every week when we, when we observe the Lord's Supper. That God is with us. Jesus is with, with us. We are remembering, we are re-engaging with what Jesus did for us on the cross. And not, not always with great sadness, although there are times when we need to wear that mantle, that, that Jesus went to the cross because of us and for us. But he did so to rescue us. And so we celebrate, we salute Jesus with the wine we toast Jesus and we say thank you for setting us free and not just setting us free, but inviting us home and making home here now real. The home that is eternal that we look forward to, we have a piece of that now because you are here with us. We are rooted to Jesus. We are rooted to God's sovereignty. We are rooted to the eternal, which as we talked about begins already. We are in the midst of eternity. Eternity is not something we look forward to. Eternity is something we dwell in and enjoy now because God is with us. Well, how do you conclude something like that? I mean, that's the title of the sermon, right? The conclusion. How do we conclude 21 weeks of all things rooted. What is the conclusion to 21 weeks of all things rooted? Anybody have an idea? Zoomers, that would include you? Grow some roots, yes. <laughs> the conclusion is grow some roots. I like that. If we were to put a scripture on it, what scriptures do you think would be in that mix? What's the conclusion of all things rooted? Now, the first one that came to my mind was John 3. Exactly. It's funny that that's our reading, but exactly right. What would another one be? Might be on the other side of the page. We sang a song about it, too. There's one, there's only one great command, right? No, no, no. Two greatest commands. So between John 3.16, Matthew chapter 22, any other scriptures pop to mind? 
this actually would have made a good trifecta. The other one to me was Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Anybody remember that one? Sure you do. JJ taught that. How long ago was that? Was that last year? I'm going to grab that one out of here. Grab that one out of here. Yeah, get that over there. Yeah. Yeah. Read it. Read it. If you are, yes, exactly right. And that actually is one of our scripture. Oh, the, the Psalm 1, verse 3. Oh, you know what? I do have that. I do, I do, I do, I do. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. I do. So it begins, Psalm 1 begins, Blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law, on God's law, they meditate day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that it does, it prospers. Yeah, good one. Good one. Very good. That's the one, the conclusion of the matter. Yes. And I said I was going to read that one, didn't I? What did I do? Here it is. Now all has been heard. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, for Bible trivia purposes, that's mitzvah. Remember in Psalm 119, there are a number of different words that are translated law, commandment, decree. In fact, it is eight. Is that right? You Psalms folks? I think that's right. Okay. Agree to disagree. Now we'll we'll look that one up. Um, for this is the duty of all mankind. Now that's the NIV. The ESV says, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. In trying to summarize and trying to conclude all things rooted, it's incredible how these very familiar passages have such a deep rootedness about them. I mean, just look at them very quickly. So in Ecclesiastes 19, it's interesting. The NIV says, not, and I'm going to go back up to verse 9, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people, pondering and searching out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find, well, the ESV says the preacher. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought, what's the difference between teacher and preacher? Well, in Scripture, apparently not much. I don't know why I thought that was interesting, but I thought that was very interesting. Um, the word there in the in the dictionaries said that the one leading the worship of the Lord, uh, the one the one that was up front. But it's interesting that these words, the words of the wise, the words that the teacher, the preacher has has given, are like goads, right? Prompting, urging, spurring people on. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. I'd never noticed that before. I wonder if Solomon here was thinking of Psalm 23. I wonder if his daddy had sung that song to him over and over and over. I wonder if his daddy, David, had emphasized and taught through his life and through his words the sovereignty of God, that only God's wisdom is good for life, is to be fully trusted for life. And not in a negative way, but in a way that 
that shared the primacy because I, I this this is what I get when I study David, the primacy of God's wisdom, and and what I mean by that is, it's so good and so trustworthy and so beautiful and so empowering and enriching and freeing that it just supersedes anything else out there. Then he says, after all has been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter. After all has been heard in Jewish ears, after all has been taken in and studied and understood, after all has been considered, putting it all together, here it is. Fear God. That word is a big word. It is to be so afraid of something that you cower at it. You are in deep dread of it. And yet it leads you to an overwhelming awe of this thing and an honoring. I think sometimes we want God to be our best buddy so much that we forget how powerful and how awful, awful, scary, awe-full he is as well. God's mercy, God's grace is a gift. And when we lose how big and powerful and how righteous he is, and when we forget how far away from that we are, that familiarity that breeds contempt begins creeping in. And our worship begins to be more like a pat on the back rather than a falling on our face in reverence. Fear God and keep his commandments. Hold tightly to follow, live out. And then this next line, for this is the duty of all mankind. That's the NIV. The ESV, for this is the whole duty of man. You know what the interesting thing about that line is? The word duty is not there. No duty in Hebrew. It is, a, it is one word, coal. Everything it means. It means everything, the whole, which I believe is why the ESV says the whole duty of man. But really, it should be, can be read, should be read, for this is the whole of man. This is it. This is life. This is everything. To fear God and keep his commandments. The deepest place of rootedness that Solomon is trying to teach us is that when everything is about God, when everything is of God and from God and to God and for God, there will be life that invades that place and a joy and a clarity that is beyond any Hollywood movies with any self-help books, advice, any political party's promises. That only when we get to the point where we, where we truly fear God, where we dread his awesome power and love his incredible chesed, and we fight to keep his commandments, when the whole of our lives is centered on that, then we will know true freedom. Then we will know true joy. Then we will know true life. Matthew 22. Let me try and get through this quickly here. We're very familiar with this, and we love this passage. It's just great stuff. The Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus and to, so they can get him in trouble <clears throat> because he's getting too popular, and they don't like that anymore, so they're going to test him. What's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered it in a relatively traditional way for the, the teachers of that day. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Those were considered the two greatest commandments. What Jesus did different, what he did to radicalize it, was to put roots on it, was to put it into its proper perspective. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Mega and proto. We use those words in English. When something is mega, what is it? It's big, right? Used to have, you know, the 16-ounce drink at 7-Eleven, then 24, then 32, and then the mega drink, and it was like a bucket that you had to carry, right? It's a mega. It's bigger than anything else. Megadon, the biggest, baddest dinosaur. Uh, Megatron in the, in the, uh, in the Transformers, thank you. The biggest and the baddest of the best. I mean, the, the, the mega is big. The same thing. That's what the, that's what the Greek is. This is the mega commandment: love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then proto, prototype, first, right? In the Greek, it's slightly different. It is used in a comparative sense, and it simply means it is greater, it is better, it is of more importance than all others. It is the primacy. So mega and primacy. This is the absolute above and beyond. This is the command. Well, who's going to argue with that? Certainly not a Jew. Certainly not a Christian. Certainly not any follower of God Almighty. God is God. He's beyond. And this is what he did that was radical. And the second is like it. Greek word, homoios, literally one and the same. That is the literal translation, one and the same. And the second is one and the same. Figuratively, it's used to say the same stuff that's tied together, inextricably joined. The second is exactly the same. The second is so closely tied together that you cannot separate it, that, that as an entity, it becomes one. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is where Jesus radicalized his answer. That there is no properly loving God, there is no properly seeing God as great and mega and beyond and primary if you don't love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot separate those two. And love your neighbor includes love your enemy. How does that address the fractured society that we live in today? Now, I could sit up here and we could throw stones at everybody that's doing that. And then we would be doing exactly the same thing. So for us to love our neighbor as ourselves, for us to love our enemy, is to serve them and to bless them regardless of how they're treating us, regardless of what they think of us. We're going to love them until it drives them crazy. Because after all, they think we're crazy. So maybe if we drive them crazy, they'll join us. Hmm. And then he says, on these two commandments depend, ESV, NIV says, hang, all the law and all the prophets hang on these two. Which one's right? Yes. The literal translation is depend. No, I'm sorry. The literal translation actually is hang. But not hang as in, well, actually it is hang in the bad way, you know. Uh, but the, when Jesus was hung on a tree, that's the same word that's used there. Um, but it it has the idea of something strong enough that supports the others. And so then without that support, they would cease. They would be destroyed. They would they would be lost. So 
So without love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors yourself, without them being one in your life, none of the other laws and prophets make any sense. If love is not going before us, that if love is not living itself inside of us, and that if love is not following us and pushing us forward, we have missed the boat. And we need to look in the mirror instead of casting stones. Love does not cast stones. Love loves, gives, serves, blesses. Leave the name calling, leave the judging, leave all the other garbage to someone else. We live love. And then the, the third one, John 3, 16. Uh, it's, it's who we, it's, oh, it's just who we are. It's who we need to be. God's heart, God's desire is to love us. And he will love us whether we return that love or not. But his desire is to, is to be in a reciprocal relationship, even though he is greater, even though he is holier, even though we don't deserve it. He is willing to do all the work to change that and to lift us up and to bring us into his presence so that he can love on us and we can love on him. There is nothing, nothing in this world that is sweeter than being in a truly reciprocal relationship love relationship with God Almighty. It's nothing that sweet. And he's calling us to live that life and invite others to join it. I pray that these five months, this five-month journey with all things rooted has brought us to that point where we know that God is with us. But we know that our desire and our efforts now are to serve and worship and revere and honor through our lives God's kingship, his leadership, his wisdom, his beautiful commands. And that we know and trust and rest in, and oh, I'm so glad that 2023's theme is trust because we get to explore what that looks like. To trust and rest in the greater one whose name is love the greater one who rescued us and the greater one who is with us in such an integral degree, in such an involved manner that we fear no evil. Rather, we rest and lay down in green pastures that our souls are restored. Because we know that we will be with him forever. And that forever has already started because we are with him now. Oh, may our lives be becoming so deeply rooted in him that our words and our actions make our belief in him so painfully obvious to those around us, even to unbelievers, that they come to appreciate faith. Because of the blessing that in our lives it brings to them. Praise team, if you'll go ahead and come on up. So today, our closing song is Shine, Jesus, Shine. I really wrestled with this because Shout to the Lord really was perfect for it. But Shine, Jesus, Shine is such a call, such a plea, such a joyful plea. Jesus, we want you out there everywhere. And in the idea of rootedness and with the understanding of how God works, that means what? That we need to be living so rooted that we shine Jesus' light through us. That's what Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, right? We are a light on a hill. When God's life lives in us and through us, we shine the light of God in this world. So I put shine Jesus sign last so that it can be our prayer that as 
those of us that, that, that as we become more and more rooted, that Jesus' light shines brighter and brighter through us so that his name is honored more beautifully and more wonderfully in this world. If you agree with that sentiment, and I'm assuming that you do since you're here this morning, let's stand and sing this song together. <laughs>